mind. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a live stream of the Total Soccer Show here on the VR app. We're very excited to have you all with us. Even more excited to not be recording from a muddy pitch in El Salvador. <laughs> Here with me to do some roster prognosticating is a man who has watched all the games, written all the articles, and knows with confidence that Yunus Musa is this country's greatest ever athlete. It's Joe Lowry. Hi, Joe. I mean, Taylor, I'm not too far away from making that claim with Yunus <laughs> Musa right now. He was so good in this window. And, and Taylor, you and I were on this train pretty early on, like, like from maybe day one of him declaring for the U.S. or Paul Tenorio reporting that he was going to play for the U.S. Mm -hmm. He is just so much fun to watch, and he was both fun and excellent, by and large, in this window. I love me some Yunus Musa, Taylor Rockwell. So I think we can go ahead and write him in in pen as making this roster, but we'll get to him later on. We're not jumping straight to the midfielders uh, because first we should do a little bit of preamble. Joe, we've had the four games, two friendlies, two Nations League games. Don't know how much we learned from those Nations League games, but we learned a little bit from the friendlies. What are we doing here today with those games and many other games in mind? Sure. So we are here today at a natural stepping off point towards the World Cup. So we're looking ahead to November 21st or really a couple of weeks before November 21st. And we're talking about the USMNT's roster for the World Cup. It's going to be huge. So we're going to talk about players position by position. We're going to build out our 26 man, not 23 man, but 26 man roster for this group. And we're going to go through and pick a starting a lineup as well. So we feel like Taylor that we've watched enough. We know enough about this team to get pretty darn close to what Greg Berhalter is going to go for in November, if pretty much everybody's healthy by then. So we're going to go through, talk about the squad, talk about the roster, build a lineup and talk some World Cup. And you mentioned if everyone is healthy, obviously we've got five months or so before we get to that World Cup. But Joe, you said it last night on a review show. Well, we have that amount of time to kind of figure things out, to see how things play out. We are only 180 minutes of yep. USMNT soccer away from them playing in the World Cup, which is a crazy difference to try to get our heads around. So hopefully this show will help us get our heads further around it as we go through those positions, figure out which 26 players we are mostly comfortable, including on our roster. I went through quickly before we started. I think I have about 19 that I would say with confidence will be there. And then there's maybe three more that I would say with somewhat confidence will be there. Uh, but let's start with the goalkeepers and see how we go. We would assume there would be three and we would assume two of them will be Matt Turner and Zach Steffen. Uh, Joe, I listed Matt Turner first to make you happy, but also because I think we're both comfortable saying he is our starter, if not Greg Berhalter's. It really does feel that way. And I, I think, I don't know, part of me, Taylor, has a sneaking suspicion that maybe Greg Berhalter is coming around as well. So Zach Steffen missed this June window due to family reasons, so he wasn't involved for the U.S. Matt Turner got multiple starts. Sean Johnson got one against Uruguay, and Ethan Horvath played last night against El Salvador. Matt Turner is the best shot stopper that the U.S. has. And, and, and in soccer, where only one player, Taylor Rockwell, I'm breaking news here, where only one player can use their hands, it's helpful if that player is good at using their hands. And Matt oh. Turner is good at using his hands. The, the one weird thing about Turner is he's also making a move. So he's headed to Arsenal uh, really in the next couple of weeks where he's going to likely be a backup. Maybe he competes for that starting job. We don't know yet. But that is the one thing that I think really prevents him from grabbing this job, this starting job with both hands. But either way, Taylor Rockwell, you and I both have Matt Turner down, I believe, as our starting goalkeeper with Zach Steffen behind him. And then who's that third guy, Taylor? Who do you have as the third player? I think it could be Sean Johnson. It could be Ethan Horvath. Maybe it could be Gaga Slonina, but I, I think he's probably a little bit out of the running at this point. Yeah, we are taking listener comments, by the way. Uh, MRB Gizzle 8818, that's a convenient username for this one, uh, says, don't say Horvath, whatever you do. Similarly, McIntyre says, will they read our comments? Yes to McIntyre. To Horvath, I will not say his name. He is another player who will be theoretically in the Premier League next season with Nottingham Forest, but we would not expect him to start, though their starter from this season is gone. In comes, we think, maybe Dean Henderson or another sort of higher caliber goalkeeper. So we could be in a situation sure. where we have three U.S. goalkeepers all on the bench next season in the Premier League. And so I don't have Horvath for that reason. Also for the mistake last night and some of the other mistakes we've seen from him, I thought that was his opportunity to maybe move up the rankings. And I think he didn't take it, whereas Sean Johnson... Yes, it's get a Grenada. Yes, it's not the strongest team, but he still makes the save. He still keeps the Uruguay. clean sheet. He still yeah, does what Uruguay. you want to see. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, there you go. 
So I think with Sean Johnson, I saw enough of him and have seen enough of him to say that he makes me comfortable as the sort of veteran presence, the guy who's there who probably knows he won't be playing, but still helps fill out that roster and can be competitive if by some strange situation we end up needing to call on that third goalkeeper. Sure. Yeah. And, and let me explain quickly. I'm sure the viewers saw it. I held up this piece of paper to the screen. This is our very high tech, ingenious way of going through our starting 11. So Matt Turner, we have as the starting goalkeeper, Taylor. I think we're, we're, we're together on that. Maybe Greg Berhalter is with us, but either way, Matt Turner is the number one. And then we think Zach Steffen is Sean Johnson filling out that goalkeeper pool. All right. So those are our three goalkeepers. Uh, we've got Matt Turner as our starter, even if Greg Berhalter maybe disagrees for now. We'll see how it plays out. Joe, who have we got starting as our first center back? Let's move to the defense. Okay. So center back, there's a number of different options here, but I think there's one very, very clear option, which I am writing down right now. Taylor Rockwell, you already know who it is. It is Walker Zimmerman. Zim. He is going to be one of the two starters if he's healthy for the World Cup. I don't know if it should be one M or two, really. I think I just it should be two on that. What is wrong? Come on, Joe. <laughs> Taylor. This is like if you want to if you want to be the secretary for the Total Soccer Show, if you're going to keep the minutes, if you're going to keep the notes, I mean, I don't know even what to make of this performance. It's as bad as, <laughs> as Ethan Horvath's lack of a save last night. That's what I'm saying up front. Oh, I, I have a long way to go, Taylor, to be secretary of TSS. <laughs> I will say, you can always add an M, but you cannot take oh, an M go. away when you're writing in Sharpie. So I covered my bases. Walker Zimmerman is going to be starting mm -hmm. after Miles Robinson went down with that Achilles injury with Atlanta United. Robinson is really the only regular World Cup qualifying center back that's left and healthy for the U.S. right now. I think he didn't do anything to change his stock in June. So he's going to be one. Taylor, my pick for the other player here mm -hmm. is not the player we saw in june it's not right okay so this is going to be a player that wasn't involved in the june camp he's instead dealing with a little bit of a knock right now after playing in the bundesliga it is chris richards again look at the beautiful handwriting he didn't play but for me taylor aaron long and camera cutter victors and eric palmer brown didn't grab this second open center back spot they didn't They're, they none of those players were all that good i don't think they showed flashes but none of them really seized the moment in june aaron long i thought you saw his passing let the us down a few times in terms of ball circulation and breaking lines he was also spacey defensively in some moments in and around the box cameron cutter vickers was suspect in the air at times eric palmer brown only played 45 minutes and then was dealing with a hamstring injury and in his 45 minutes against uruguay i don't think showed all that much of anything positive so really taylor unless you disagree Chris Richards kind of gets this this spot by default for me. I don't know if Berhalter feels that way or not, but for me right now watching these games, I think Richards can do more to help the U.S. next to Walker Zimmerman than any of those other players I mentioned. It, it's strange to say about a player who wasn't there. There was a part of me, even though I knew you were going to pick Chris Richards, the preamble was would have been sort of hilarious if you'd written down Miles Robinson anyway, knowing he <laughs> won't be there because we did think it would be Miles Robinson and uh, Walker Zimmerman as our starters. It won't be Robinson due to injury. Uh, but yeah, I'm with you that I don't think Long or CCV, like not that either one of them was necessarily poor. They were just little moments, little moments of indecision or errant passing uh, or lack of aerial prowess on occasion that I think there wasn't that like, yeah, they're they're good, but I don't see them as necessarily the starters right now. It feels like Chris Richards definitely remains in that conversation. And if he has a good couple games or a good game in September and gets a move, a permanent move to Hoffenheim is what we would hope for, uh, then maybe that really does put him into that like sort of starting conversation. I think I'm comfortable with him as that out and out starter. Joe, between now and when this roster is named though, a quick question for you. Like I struggle to think what Long or uh, or CCV could have done that would have made me be like, nope, they locked it down. Like it's not as though either one was beaten hor horrifically. It's not like they conceded a bunch of goals. I think I'm inclined to say it's just if we could have seen them be really, really good on the ball and in their passing, that would have maybe stood out to me and made me feel a bit more comfortable. Yeah, just impacting the game more on both sides of the ball. I think that that's it's that simple, right? Neither player really sees the game in possession. Neither player really seemed entirely sure of themselves defensively. Mm -hmm. So those are the things I would have liked to see. And maybe we'll see more of that in September. I don't think we're going to see dramatic changes really in either of their games between now and September. We both know that, that Aaron Long is going to be with the Red Bulls until the end of the MLS season. And Cameron Cutter-Vickers is now a permanent player at Celtic. So not a lot's going to change 
playing style wise and situation wise. I will say, even though neither one of those players really wowed me, if we're taking four center backs on this 26 player roster, which I think makes some sense, mm -hmm. and maybe we'll have some cover on one of the fullback spots. I do think it is Zimmerman. I do think it's Richards. And I do think it's Long and CCV filling out yep. the bottom of that depth chart, even though I'm not totally enamored with either one of those guys right now. Yep, no argument from me, and we'll see how injuries play out. We'll see how form goes between now and yeah. then. But but I'm with you. It's not as though Long and CCV were, were outright bad. Just, I think, didn't do enough to make me think, yep, one of them is the starter, whereas Chris Richards still has that possibility. Uh, we are getting lots of questions uh, in the chat. We will come back to those because it's tough to see them as they come in while we're talking about the positions, but we've had <laughs> a few more about goalkeepers. Uh, so uh, time permitting, we'll get back and answer more of those as we go. But for now, Joe, let's talk fullbacks. Feels oh, yeah. kind of like they pick themselves at this point, even with, again, one of those players that we would expect to start not being involved in this camp. So let's start with the right back. And I think everybody knows what my Sharpie is writing on this very large post it note right now. It is Serginho Dest. This Jack is very, Moore. very obvious. Oh, my bad. My he, bad. Wasn't with, <laughs> he wasn't with the U.S. in this window dealing with an injury that he suffered with Barcelona. But his quality on the ball is a game changer for the U.S. And I think we really saw the difference between Dest and the other players. That's an epic photo, by the way. It really the three is. giant <laughs> hats in the back with Dest like fully in the zone. That is great work. So Dest is going to be the starter, oh, Taylor. There's no doubt about that. Yep. Let's go to the left back and look at the starting left back before we fill out the rest of these positions. Our favorite Star Wars themed USMT mm -hmm. player. It's Jedi Robinson. It has to be. He is the only real quality left back option the U.S. has right now. I'm not saying he's a perfect player, but he is the one guy that has played consistently at that spot. And Taylor, what's more is he has played so much soccer this year and he is still going out there and running and playing hard. He played a thousand games for Fulham basically in England and has come in and played real minutes in this June window as well. That's an encouraging sign, I think, for the U.S. as they head into the World Cup, yeah. given how little we know, even after 360 plus minutes of soccer in June, how little we know, Taylor, about the rest of the left back depth chart. Mm -hmm. And it makes me really happy that we have in Anthony Robinson, a dual national who came in, didn't really impress. We've talked about why that might have been the case uh, when he first got starts and maybe how that was a bit unfair. Some of the judgment that came his way, some of the criticism. But from there... He, he's basically become one of the more important parts, obviously, of the defense, but also of the attack that we see him now playing as the, almost the left winger on occasion. It gives Pulisic license to Rome. And in that way, I think he is almost irreplaceable in this one. I guess the argument would be that if he does get hurt, Serginho Dest is the left back most capable of doing what he does. But it's wild to see how far Anthony Robinson has come, at least in my estimation, it seems like in Greg Berhalter's and yours as well, yeah. that he is now an automatic starter, an automatic lock. He, he played... I, I'm going to guess the most minutes of pretty much anybody in this squad in this camp. And I think that's justified because of everything we've seen from him. Still want his crossing to get a little bit better, just a little bit better. But I'm, I agree. Anthony Robinson, our left back, Serginho Dest, our right back. But Joe, now things get a little bit murkier when it comes to depth because we have a lot of options, all of them at right back, basically. We do have some left back uh, yep. potential, but none of them, similar to players we've already talked about, have really taken that opportunity, have shown it to be theirs and no one else's. Uh, so what would you like to see Greg Berhalter do, or what do you have him doing uh, when it comes to those remaining fullback spots? I would say we probably have at least two, if not three, based on the way we've structured our roster. Sure. So I think there should be three additional fullbacks here to get us to five. I have three right backs and two left backs. Now the second left back, Taylor, we're going to have to talk out, but I think we're on the same page with the two right backs, Reggie Cannon as one and DeAndre Edlin as the other. And there are two very distinct reasons why I think these players are going to be on the world cup roster. Let's start with Yedlin. If John Brooks is not involved with the U.S., and at this point under Greg Berhalter, it doesn't seem like he's going to be, DeAndre Yedlin will be the one player, most likely the one player, who has played in a World Cup before. He is a veteran in this group. He's been there. He understands some of what it's like. I, I'm not totally in love with him trying to do a Sergio Dest impression on that right side. I, I think there's a big drop-off in quality between Dest and, and Yedlin and Cannon. But Yedlin, for his veteran presence and for seemingly how he acts in the locker room, I think you have to sort of rely on some of those intangibles with the backup fullback spot. So that's one. Cannon is the other. I, I don't mm -hmm. think Cannon played all that well as a classic right back, as, as sort of a modern overlapping right back. 
in this window. But Taylor, what I do think he can do is he can play that hybrid role, that hybrid right yeah. back in defense and right center back in attack that we saw not once, but twice in this window. We saw it in the first game against Barocco, and we saw it again in the second half last night against El Salvador, despite all the mud and the stoppages of play and everything else. So we've seen him do it multiple times, and he does that right center back job for Boavista in Portugal as well. I think his flexibility and his ability to slot a little bit deeper and just provide safe cover at right back and right center back makes Cannon a, a pretty solid option for this roster. Left back, though, Taylor, it could be George Bello. It could be Joe Scally. It could be Dewan Jones. It could be Kevin Paredes. I have sort of a favorite among that group, but I'm curious, do you have someone that really stands out to you? Honestly, no. Um, like, I think I like, I like what we've seen from George Bello on occasion, but I don't think we've seen enough of it. And I think he got 30 minutes as a substitute in this camp. And I think that tells us something about where he fits in. Whereas Joe Scally, we did, did see get a start. We have seen sort of come onto the radar a bit more and we would expect even with a new manager, we'll get time with Gladbach this season as a right back, as a left back. I know that neither one of us has been overly impressed by what we've seen from him at club level. I don't think either one of us really loved what we saw from him for the United States, but I also don't think it was like out now, like, nope, he is not good enough. He is not going to be able to get the job done. So I think between now and again, the time the squad is selected, I have the most confidence in Joe Scally to continue to kind of raise his game, round it out, just get a little bit sharper on the ball, a little bit sharper with both feet. So I had Joe Scally as my final fullback. I think Scally is my pick as well, Taylor. I, my heart, my heart wants to go for Kevin Paredes, though. Playing with Wolfsburg, mm. didn't get many minutes at all. Just barely got a taste of the Bundesliga this past season after moving over from DC United in the winter. But I think he's a really talented player. He still has a lot to improve. But he is someone I would just say, hey, folks, keep your eyes on this guy. He's a young player really skillful has played in a bunch of different positions as well in the past he's comfortable rotating inside he brings something different in that left back spot than jedi he's less of a north south player although he does does still go north and south paredes can also go east west which i think has some appeal but either way taylor we're gonna have to wait and see who that player is but for today i think joe scally is a good pick yeah exactly i think there, there are a few different positions where i think very much whoever catches form whoever starts to just sort of become a conversation a uh, point of conversation and if that's kevin paredes uh with preseason with wolfsburg and then in the new season i wouldn't be surprised but yeah i'm with you that right now it seems like joe scally has done enough joe before we move to the midfield a, a few questions to get to uh a very fair one from uh harris kriskich uh is there zero chance of john brooks making this roster I would not say there is zero chance, uh, but we still don't have a ton of clarity on what the situation is with him. Greg Berhalter, yeah. Berhalter has talked previously about how his form at club level wasn't good enough, and he knows there's some things he needs to improve upon, uh, and that there would be opportunities this summer. Then when the summer roster is named, I think that was changed to, well, there's some uncertainty about what's going to happen with his new club because he needs to go find one. He's available on a free so we wanted to have him sort of get the club situation settled and then he can work on some things to see if he gets back into the conversation. I am still of the opinion that there are other things that have happened that we don't know about, that maybe it's personal. My complete conjecture is that and maybe there's other things as well, but that maybe Brooks isn't the best player to have on the bench. Maybe he kind of resents that one. Again, I don't know, but it just seems like there are pers personal and personnel issues there. So I don't see John Brooks making this roster pending some sort of big swing in his relationship with Greg Berhalter. Totally agree. I don't have much to add to that. It doesn't feel like we're going to see Brooks in September, and it really doesn't feel like we're going to see him in November, which I think is a shame just in terms of what he can do on the ball. But I do think that's the reality of the situation right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple more Brady Ryan four. don't waste a spot on a backup left back. If something happens to Robinson, Dest can play there. That is true. I just, I, I have some like discomfort about having to move Dest from one side to the other. And then maybe yeah. that changes the way we want to play with that right back, because though it's Reggie Cannon can do the sort of moving in and becoming a right center back uh, role, or it's DeAndre Yedlin on the overlap. I don't think Yedlin is, is nearly as good at that as Serginho Dest is going to be. And I don't think Serginho Dest is going to be able to do what Reggie Cannon does and moving to a center back spot. So I think, if Dest is back in there, my assumption is that we'll see two pretty attacking fullbacks on either side of the pitch. And when you move Dest over, I don't know if you have that same flexibility. I'm not sure you have it in 
uh, Scally either, but I think I'm just more comfortable in bringing at least one uh, potential left back. Again, we'll see how things move along as we go. Uh, but Joe, let's keep it going. Let's talk about midfield. I'm going to assume that we can just go ahead and have Tyler Adams listed uh, number one uh, in your heart, on your roster, everything else. I should have had this, Taylor. I should have had this piece of paper written like eight years ago at this point. It's it is good. Tyler Adams. He's he's going to be the starter as the number six. He is the guy in midfield for Greg Berhalter, and he should be, right? The value that he brings defensively, it makes sense to have him in that spot. The backup here is also pretty clear to me. So if we're talking two number sixes before we get to the number eights, Kel Nacosta makes the most sense as that backup number six. We've seen bits and pieces of what he can do. Uh, he's, he's decent on the ball when he has time and space. He's an asset on set pieces, which I think could be really valuable for the U.S. in a tournament situation. But either way, Adams and Acosta entered this window as the two number sixes for the U.S., and I think they're leaving it, Taylor, as the two number sixes as well. Joe, uh, Matt Doyle, uh, in his sort of roster preview that he did with Tom Bogert, did not have Kellen Acosta as a lock to make his roster, specifically because he's not playing that same position at club level. Do you have any concern about that, combined with not seeing him as much in this camp? Or do you feel like we've, we've seen enough and Acosta can do things that other uh, potential deputies cannot? Uh, I don't know that Acosta can do things that other deputies can't, but I'm not all that concerned about him and, and not getting a ton of minutes at the six for LAFC. He still rotates into that spot and, and has some similar reps where he's doing similar things for, for club that, he's, that he does for country. I just think with how much Peralta has relied on Acosta over the last year, really getting a ton of minutes in, in big moments last summer, getting big minutes in World Cup qualifying, I think he's going to be the guy. Nothing for me has really changed on that. I don't love his game, but I think he brings value and experience at that number six spot at a time where not a lot of other players in the U.S. pool have that experience. Uh, we do have some other possibilities there, if not Acosta. If James Sands has a really strong start to the season with Rangers, maybe he's in the conversation. Uh, similarly, Jean-Luc Abusio has been in camp before, and less so recently. Uh, I think the argument there was that he's had a rigorous club season. They wanted to give him a break. Could you see either one of those players uh, supplanting Kellen Acosta? Yeah, I could. It would just take a lot. I think it would take a really strong start to the year. And and really, Taylor, there's only going to be like a month or even a little less of, of games over in Europe before that September window. So it's going to be very difficult for those players to challenge, but the door isn't closed. And so in, in that way, maybe Count Acosta isn't a total lock, but I think he's just about as close to a lock as you can get in Greg Berhalter's mind after Tyler Adams. Mm -hmm. I think James Sands, if we were to go with maybe two, two right backs or three right backs and one left back, maybe that opens a spot for a yeah. sort of hybrid midfield or center back. Maybe that's James Sands. Uh, but for now, I, I agree with you, Joe. I had Adams with Acosta uh, as his deputy. Then we know we're going to have our two number eights uh, in no particular order, because I think he could go either way at this point, Joe. Uh, who is your first number eight you would like included on the roster? It's Weston McKinney, Taylor Rockwell, who I thought was excellent last night against El Salvador. He came on the field. He's still recovering from a broken foot that he had with Juve. He's still getting back to full fitness. And I think we saw that earlier on in this window. But he came on and hit two of the best passes of the entire game. He had some beautiful balls. He was energetic in midfield, driving the ball forward. I thought he was excellent last night. And it gave us a glimpse of Weston McKinney at his best. So Weston McKinney is one for me. The other, Taylor, is Valencia's mm -hmm. Yunus Musa. After everything we saw from Musa in this window with him dropping deep, being positioned purposely by Greg Berhalter to play in a double pivot, I thought he was brilliant over and over again, driving the ball forward, also showing some nice passing. I think even maybe we saw improvement from game to game in terms of his passing and his willingness to release the ball. Defensively, I think he still has some room to improve his awareness and his ability to keep up with plays. But we, we talked about this already in the beginning of the show. He's brilliant on the ball. He's an incredible athlete. Musa and McKenney are my two starting number eights. I think Musa should be the most aggrieved that we have a winter world cup instead of a summer world cup, because the way he's playing for the United States and the things yeah. he can do that I think other players cannot have to believe he would have been the subject of a, a big money move. If the U S 40 million dollar transfer, decent. 40 million yeah. transfer. Yeah. One player we know will be on the move this summer because he has talked about it openly is another player who I think is a lock, if not to start, then to be uh, on the roster in this central midfield uh, position would be Luca Della Torre. Joe, I'm assuming you agree with that one as well. 
Totally. Luca De La Torre has to be a lock after everything we've seen from him with the U.S. really since World Cup qualifying. He's been the same player in pretty much every game, consistently driving the ball forward. He's kind of like Yunus Musa light. He's a little quicker. He buzzes around a little bit more. He's a slighter, just a slighter guy in terms of his frame and his height. But he does a lot of the same stuff in possession and can deputize for Musa if, if Musa can't go. And he, he can also come on the field late in games like we saw last night and, and change it. Right? He plays that ball into Jordan Morris in the box. He has a good right foot, just really technical and aggressive in how he plays. I love Luca De La Torre in that role. Taylor, those are the three obvious eights in my mind. Brendan Aronson maybe could do that job, but I think it makes more sense mm -hmm. to pencil him in as a winger on this roster. So if we're looking for someone else who can, who can play as one of those number eights, who's the guy? Like, who is that player? Yeah, uh, based on the comments we're getting, I don't think this answer is going to get a ton of love, <laughs> but I think right now it's probably Christian Roldan, and I don't think that's because he's going to play. I think there are other options ahead of him, but I think also, as you mentioned, if, say, Weston McKinney goes down and Luca De La Torre can't play, I wonder if maybe Brendan Aronson is the person who starts there. But Christian yeah. Roldan seems to be a, a chemistry player. He's a locker room guy. I think he's also... From what I've read and from some of the quotes I've seen, a very good intermediary, basically, between Greg Berhalter and the team. I think he kind of functions well then as almost like an assistant coach at times and helping with some of the instruction and, and has a bit of the kind of veteran profile behind him. So I know he's going to be uh, a not a controversial one necessarily, but I think when there are, for lack of a better term, like sexier possibilities out there, including Gianluca Busio, who is literally just sexier, uh, then I think maybe Rodan isn't going to be the most popular consensus pick. But I think he's another player who, if we're doing this based on what we would like to see combined with what we will think we see based on past his precedent under Craig, Greg Berhalter, it feels like Roldan is a player that's in that squad, in that group from the beginning and seems to be there for now. Again, the rest or the rest of preseason, the rest of the MLS season and the start of uh, the season in Europe will tell us a lot about who can sort of raise their game. Maybe Busio can catch fire and, and get some more minutes and get some more looks in that September window. But for now, I have it as Christian Roldan rounding out that midfield. Yeah, I'd be hard-pressed to disagree with you, Taylor. I don't think, like you said, we'll see rolled on, but I think he, like Yedlin, could be another voice in the locker room. I really think when push comes to shove, and if the U.S. needs another player, it will be Aronson or it will be Gio Reyna over mm -hmm. someone like Christian rolled on. But if you take those players out of the winger pool, I think you're looking at a similar issue in terms of who steps up and plays. There just aren't enough clear-cut options, either as the, the real backup eights, the, the really deep down-the-depth chart players, at the number eight spot or in the winger spot. So I'm not really sure it's worth quibbling about who that player is going to be necessarily. Yeah, and I think and I think also for me, there there is as strange as this sounds, especially when we're talking about building a World Cup roster, when you have 26 players, I think you have more flexibility and you're able to sort of look at what gives you the best overall team chemistry as well as team yeah. ability. And Berhalter talked about how that was a sort of team unifier last night, that result, that you could see the response, you could see the way the team came together. And and I think that sort of chemistry, that sort of core belief is what he is going to be prioritizing. I don't expect him to do a ton of experimenting between now and the World Cup because then you're disrupting things, you're throwing off that chemistry, you're throwing off that rhythm. And I think that's another reason why Roldan is in there. Maybe it's Eric Williamson. I think Georgi Mihailovic is a big loser because he wasn't able to play. That's a out of context. Yeah. That sounds bad. But I think we would have seen him playing more centrally and given more creative license, but he has to pull out due to injury. And it's tough for me to see him getting sustained looks in those September friendlies. So I think he might end up missing out because he missed out in this camp. Yeah, Georgie is a guy who I think has a little bit of a chance. He's a, a huge loser of this this window. You're right, Taylor, because of that injury. But man, if he's playing well for Montreal, or maybe he's moved to Europe by then and is getting minutes in Serie A, if he's with Bologna or wherever he ends up, I do think there's a real chance that someone pushes Roldan off the depth chart, off, and really off of the World Cup roster. I think Roldan, as of now, is like the last player that I would have, or, or one of the last two guys that I would have in the squad. So his spot is is pretty much anything but secure. All right. So far, I think we're we're, we're pretty much in agreement. Uh, Joe, let's move to our wide attackers, since I think if we if we're going with just four, I think all four kind of pick themselves. But I think our sure. expectation is that we'll be going with at least five. So starting on the right side, who would you say is going to be our starter uh, based on what we have seen thus far? OK, so, Taylor, this is a really difficult one for me because of how much uh, of a fan I am of Gio Reyna. 
but today <laughs> and and given everything yeah. we know about Jorana's injury yeah. issues I don't I don't know if we can slot him in the starting lineup if everyone's healthy I I kind of do believe that it should be Reina but we just don't know what that's going to look like so with that said Tim Weah who is still an excellent and totally serviceable option on the right side I think he's a really good player Taylor he's very athletic. We saw him play a couple of different roles in this window. We saw him occupy the, the really wide channel on the right side in the first game against Morocco. And we saw him inside more as in that, that kind of right half space area other times in the window as well. He's, he's a game changer for the U.S. when he's on the field. I don't know that this was necessarily his best window for the U.S. ever, mm -hmm. but you can still see his importance to this team. So Wea is my guy on the right side, and it's got to be Christian Pulisic on the left side. You think yeah. back to that Morocco game that run in behind that he has and the touch that he has to bring the ball down and then play the ball to Brendan Aronson for that goal. I mean, it's, it's just an incredible sequence that shows how dangerous Pulisic can be. He is still really important to this team. And despite some real up and down performances, I think he is the starter on the left wing. Taylor, you referenced the other two players and we've already mentioned both of them in this episode, Gio Reyna and Brendan Aronson. Those are the top four wingers in the pool right now, hands down. It's very straightforward. The only question is, does Geo or Wea start on the right and does Aronson push his way into midfield like we saw in every single game of this window we don't know exactly what that's going to look like but in terms of listing out this roster those four players are the top and then the question is who should that fifth winger be and I think there's maybe a little more debate there I think there is, uh, because I don't think he necessarily helped his case last night by getting a red card nine minutes into his appearance, or maybe 19, I forget what the timeline was. Uh, but Paul Ariola is another one similar to Christian Roldan, who seems to be a Greg Berhalter guy. He seems to do what Berhalter wants, seems pretty coachable, uh, does the defensive side, has the work rate, but then can obviously facilitate attacking play, has the chemistry with Jesus Ferreira. I said in our review... I have a hard time being too critical of that red card because I think he was sure. sent in with a, a mandate of be physical, get stuck in, win the ball, kind of restore that energy. And I think the argument would be that maybe he took that too far. But I think if I'm choosing between right now, Paul Evriola and Jordan Morris, though Jordan Morris scores a great header and gets into great position to be able to do so, I still think I haven't seen him return to the sharpness, especially with that speed that we've come to expect from him. I would love to see him just improve that overall top gear that we've, we've come to expect, but also get that kind of touch back under control. So right now, I give the edge to Paul Ariola. Uh, there are other options in there. We could see potentially Conrad De La Fuente get some time in September if his club situation improves. But for now, it feels like it's the four you listed. And then for me, it's Paul Ariola as the fifth. I agree. I, my heart, Taylor, wants it to be Jordan Morris mm -hmm. because I think he can do more on the ball and is just he's an electric player when he is really healthy mm -hmm. and at full speed. But he's not right now. And at this point, after multiple big knee injuries, I don't know what that's going to look like in November. Yeah. So with that in mind, Areola is the safer option. But I do think, like we just mentioned with Rodan, that that last winger spot is not, it's not certain right now. And so a lot can change there between now and, and really the World Cup. Maybe it's Morris, maybe it's Areola, maybe it's someone else. But today, if, I, if I'm looking ahead today to November, it is Paul Areola for me. All right, so we've got two remaining roster spots. I wanted to go back to one thing very quickly uh, to your point about Tim Weah, because I think that will raise some eyebrows. There is still so much love for Gio Reyna, and justifiably so. I consistently hear him referred to as the most talented player out and out in the entire U.S. pool, and I'm not even sure that's incorrect, but I think the reality is we haven't seen him for the United States since September when he gets the injury. We saw him make a very brief cameo for Dortmund, and then he re-aggravates the injury, and we saw him uh, leaving the pitch in tears, and then his season is over. And so that's sort of where he is in his injury and his fitness, whereas Tim Weah, over that same time period, uh, there was the story prior to the Mexico game, or I guess just after the Mexico game when the U.S. wins at home in Cincinnati, about how Weah had had conversations with Berhalter and had requested tape, requested film analysis sessions together, really wanted to know what he could improve on, what he needed to do differently, how he needed to fit into the system and since then has been a, basically an ever-present starter and I think has really risen in Greg Berhalter's estimation. Uh, there's always the question about could Wea be the number nine and could we get Ray, uh, Reina in on the right-hand side and we haven't seen that very much, if at all, in my mind. Uh, Berhalter was asked about that. There's a great article uh, Henry Bushnell wrote about 
basically predicting the roster. Uh, and here was the quote. Uh, playing as a high winger, threatening the back line, Berhalter said last week, Wea is getting chances like we think forwards do at times. We've considered Wea at striker, I think only in special circumstance situations. So it seems like we're going to get Wea at right wing. And right now, Reyna isn't fit. We haven't seen him. We would assume he'll be back to full fitness. We hope he'll be back to full fitness. But it seems a bit silly in my mind to have Reyna starting over a fit Tim Weah, who has performed very well for the United States until last night, where he had sort of a down game, as you said. So, Joe, that leaves us with two, excuse me, three open spots. I said two earlier, but that was because I had already penciled in our starting number nine. Right now, Joe, who sure. have we got as our starting number nine? Okay, so Taylor, before quickly we go to the strikers, I want to go through our 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 uh, Chris Ronald Dan pick was as we predicted quite polarizing. So yeah. we have at DT Berenstein in the chat, yeah, um, saying Roll Dan question mark question mark question mark, which is fair, right? I don't think I just want to be clear. None of us are really that strongly. None of us feel that strongly about Christian Roldan being on this roster. The issue is how do you build a squad with players that have maybe been with the U.S. that that has enough other players to push him out. I think if Georgi Mihailovic plays in this window, we're having a different conversation, to be totally honest yep. with you. But he didn't. And so that makes it difficult to rule Roldan out. And then we have B. Chodos in the chat saying character, versatility, stability, Roldan's the right pick. So, I mean, we, we don't really know. I'm assuming that might be a Seattle Sanders fan. We don't know. But we don't really know what that's going to look like. As we said, that is a, a really difficult one to call right now. That said, Taylor, I don't think this spot that we're talking about, the number nine spot, is all that difficult to talk about right now it is jesus well, ferreira yeah. as the starting number <laughs> yeah. nine it has to be right it, it just has to yep. be. there's no one else at this point that has done the job consistently enough for the u.s men's national team to be considered over jesus ferreira who while it didn't while he didn't score in in really the the bigger games of this window continues to move and get into good spots off the ball he scores four against granada it's not like granada is a very high quality team but you can see his movement over and over again not just in that game in austin but in this entire window he is clearly someone that greg baralter trusts and he's going to be I would, I would be shocked, Taylor, let me put it this way, if he is not the starting number nine against Wales in that first game of the World Cup. Even in the game, Taylor, where Haji Wright was going to get the start, and that was supposed to be his game last night against El Salvador, mm -hmm. Baralter yanks him at halftime and clearly wasn't impressed by what he saw from Haji Wright. He said as much basically afterwards. Jesus Ferreira continues to be the guy to get minutes in big games, and I think he's going to be the guy to get big minutes in big games in the World Cup. Yeah, for a coach who has not said clear words about John Brooks, in my mind, he gave some very clear words about Haji Wright last yeah. night. He did end it with like, but you know, he's still in consideration. It doesn't mean he's out. He could still go. But yeah, I think the remarks about how he didn't kind of take the opportunity, getting yanked at halftime, missing or failing to score that one chance, which I think he does really well to set up. And we should not forget that. But he's not able to put it on frame. And I think that is sort of a consistent criticism for a lot of different number nine options. And so when that sort of becomes par for the course, you have to then elevate your game in other areas. And I think uh, Haji Wright did not do that for me on the evening, whereas Jesus Ferreira has done that both last night and in previous games, that his runs in behind, the way he links up play, the energy, and the kind of, just the scrap, the physicality for a player who isn't particularly big. He doesn't sh shy from challenges. He gets into it. He gets stuck in. He wins uh, free kicks. And I think he facilitates attack and play better than any other number nine option we have right now. I think there's always that sort of clarifying statement to it because i don't think either one of us feels fully confident that jesus ferreira is definitely sure. the number nine but i think of everyone we've seen so far it feels like it's jesus ferreira who has at least stayed the most consistent whereas ricardo pepe catches fire and then falls off josh Sargent comes in falls off daryl dk the same jordan pfuck the same so i think there's still a ton of opportunity uh for those depth options behind ferreira and maybe even to start over ferreira uh, as time goes on but for now i'm comfortable saying jesus ferreira is our starter if this world cup starts tomorrow so taylor we've made people predictably angry with that whole conversation about ferreira i want to go to a couple questions and comments in the chat mm -hmm. so this one's from at the underscore kotf who says jesus ferreira because he scored against granada mm -hmm. the next wando so mm -hmm. I, I think i was pretty clear but let me just run it back one more time it's not because he scored against Granada. It's because Jesus Ferreira continuously finds good spaces in the attack. And he's done that against pretty much every team he's played against for the U.S., both in World Cup qualifying, before World Cup qualifying, and now in this June window. 
he moves into good spots and he presses really aggressively off the ball and understands those reads in a way, Taylor, that I don't think many other strikers do. So no, not just because he scored against Granada, but because of what he's doing that will eventually lead to goals. And I want to follow that up with a question, a comment from Tom511, who says Ferreira has never produced versus any halfway decent competition. Strange to hand him the keys at the number nine. Now, you're not wrong, Tom. You're not wrong about that. Ferreira hasn't produced against good teams. But my response to that is who has? Taylor, who has? Can, can we think of a nine that has come up big for the U.S. in the last year? I can't. It, ha it hasn't happened. It has not happened. Ricardo Pepe comes in and it is a brief spark in World Cup qualifying, and then he totally fades away. There's, there's no one else, although I do have Ricardo Pepe on this roster. There's no one else in my mind that has done that job. And so if you're trying to point the finger at Jesus Ferreira and say he hasn't done it, I would say point it at everyone and say, well, they haven't done it either. And at that point, why not go with the guy who is doing good things in the press, who is moving well in the attack, who helps bring other people into the game? It just, it seems clear to me that that's what Berthold going to do. And, and I would do the exact same thing. Maybe that makes me a bad soccer coach, but that I think is a very strong line of reasoning for why Jesus Ferreira should be the starting number nine. Yeah, I think it's really easy to say he's not good enough. I don't even know if I would necessarily disagree with that. I just think right now, compared to the other options there that we know are there, I think he is the superior option right now. And I would yeah. say that one goal against Grenada, I think his second, where he picks his head up, picks his spot, passes into the side netting, puts it in far post. I mean, that's a striker's finish. Yes, it's against weak opposition, but he still took his chance there, whereas Haji Wright didn't. And yes, it's a worse field, but it's a very similar situation in my mind. And one striker didn't perform and one did. Ferreira's had more opportunities, but I think that's because he's proven himself capable of taking those opportunities. Uh, the question as well from uh, Brady Ryan for if healthy, why not start both Reina and Wea play your most yeah. talented team rather than forcing an undeserving number nine. I think the one reason why I bring this up, the one wrinkle here would be that it's often why not start way as a striker and put Reina on the right. Uh, and I think Berhalter has sort of dismissed that. I'm guessing that's a thing they've tried and I'm guessing there are reasons why he doesn't want to do that. And I think it's because Wea offers that direct threat uh, in a way that no one else does right now because Reyna hasn't been healthy. I do wonder if Reyna were fit, if he had been able to participate in this camp or had had a more full season, if we either see Wea playing as a number nine because Reyna has the right side locked down, let's see where, where Wea can fit in, or more likely in my mind is that Wea would have stayed on the right side and we would have seen maybe Reyna get some opportunity as a false nine, dropping in, facilitating play, moving around, having a lot of kind of free roam potential with uh, Christian Pulisic alongside of him. Maybe that's a thing we would have seen, but ultimately because we haven't seen much of Gio Reyna, it's tough to know if that would work. So I think in the end for me, it's Jesus Ferreira as the starter for now. And I agree with you. I think it's Ricardo Pepe, I think is probably the, the depth option. He probably would have been in this camp, but Berhalter wanted to give him a break physically from an MLS season going straight into the Bundesliga season. But I also think mentally, I think there was a ton of pressure. There was a ton of coverage. Then there's a ton of coverage about his move and how much money uh, was paid for Pepe services. And then a ton of coverage about how he underperformed and the struggles at Augsburg, uh, both for Pepe and for the club as a whole. So I like the idea of giving him a summer to reset, regain his form, regain some fitness, and then get back out there in the preseason and show why there was that hype to begin with. So I had Pepe as my penultimate player. Joe, that's 25 players predicted. Who is your oh, yeah. 26th? I'm going with a wild card here, Taylor. Someone who has never gotten a single appearance for the U.S. men's national team is Brandon Vasquez with FC Cincinnati. Mm. I, at this mm. point, I'm just working my way down the number nine list. So I'm not all that confident in Josh Sargent. I'm not all that confident in Daryl DK. I'm not all that confident in Jossie Zardes or, or Haji Wright really at this point, although I am interested in potentially seeing him mm -hmm. again. Brendan Vasquez is a guy who Baralta is considering, unlike Jeremy Obobasi, who apparently has not heard or really is not under the impression that he's really in consideration for the U.S. men's national team. Brandon Vasquez, I think, is the next best number nine in Major League Soccer, and he's getting the ball in good spots, and he's putting the ball in the back of the net. I think he is worth a look in September. If he's still playing at all, like he has for the first couple of months, or the first few months of the MLS season, Vasquez is someone that I would strongly consider. I'm not going to go out and light anything on fire if it's not Brandon Vasquez. Like, I'm not all that passionate about this pick versus someone like Sargent or DK or even Zardes, but I think it might be worth trying yet another player if that player is still performing and producing by the time September rolls around.
Yeah, uh, you, you will get no argument from me because I have liked what I've seen from Brandon Vasquez, but also because, Joe, I went through and looked at all the other possibilities. I went so far as to see how Josie Altador was doing and if he was scoring at all and maybe if he could be in the conversation. Because I think a, a, in his prime, Josie Altador does pretty much everything Greg Berhalter wants that number nine to do, but he is not in his prime. Even at 32, I don't think he has the ability right now. Well, maybe that changes in the next month or so, but I think with only one goal in the season, Tough to put Josie Altador in there. So maybe it's Brandon Vasquez. The only other one that I still have like a soft spot for, it's not Josh Sargent, though we'll see what happens. It's Jordan Pifak. And I think yeah. we've seen him get some opportunities for the U.S. and he hasn't really taken them. It doesn't seem like he has necessarily impressed Greg Berhalter. But to see him accept the award for the top score in the Swiss League draped in an American flag, then the rumors <laughs> of him uh, with Borussia Dortmund and Borussia Mönchengladbach, if those moves were to happen, and I don't know if they are likely to happen, but if they did, it becomes a lot harder. And maybe this is just like a Euro snob or whatever, but it's a lot harder to leave Jordan Pifak out if he is playing or getting minutes for Borussia Dortmund. I, I don't. I think that has to immediately make you kind of look at him again because in the Swiss league, we don't know the overall quality or we're uncertain of, of what exactly he's doing. And I wonder if uh, in a more difficult league under more difficult conditions, if he's able to perform, then I think that tells us a yeah. bit more and gives us a, a better sample size for Jordan Pifak. So I would... I would love for him to make the roster because he then raises his game and has a good strong start to the season. But I also think there is some some potential dark horse uh, candidate out there like a Brandon Vasquez. So it's either Pifak or Vasquez for me. Joe, I leave it to you to make that final choice. Let's say Vasquez today, but if, if Jordan Pifak does move to Dortmund and starts playing well in the Bundesliga, it is definitely Jordan Pifak. I feel like that's a good yeah. place to leave that spot. Taylor, I want to go through one more time and recap our starting lineup Please. before we hit the chat one more time before we leave. Matt Turner in goal. We're going to go rapid fire with these pictures. Walker Zimmerman as the right-sided center back. Chris Richards as the left-sided center back. Serginho Dest as the starting right back in a 4-3-3. Jedi Robinson, Anthony Jedi Robinson on the left side of that back line. Tyler Adams as the number six. Then you're looking at Weston McKenney as one of the number eights. And you're looking at Eunice Musa as the other number eight in that midfield, maybe dropping a little bit deeper. Then in the front line, you have Timothy Weah on that right side. Maybe that's Gio Reyna, but right now today it is Timothy Weah. You have Christian Pulisic on the left. And we end with Jesus Ferreira, everyone's favorite player. Taylor, mm -hmm. one question I thought was interesting in the chat. We've gone through our 26 yeah. player roster. <laughs> we have a question from yeah. at Christian underscore meds. Who is the biggest dark horse to make the roster? Who is the biggest dark horse? I have one and we've already talked about him. So maybe that means he's not that big of a dark horse, but at least a dark horse is George Mihailovic for the reasons we already mentioned. Yeah. If he's playing well with Montreal, if he gets a move and plays well in Europe for that first month of the season, I think he is still a guy who can break his way and, and really make his way into either the number eight depth chart or maybe even the winger depth chart, Taylor, because he does kind of both of those jobs for the U.S. It sounds like Berhalter might have him do both of those jobs if he gets back in. It just doesn't feel like that last winger spot or the last number eight spot is really solidified. And Georgie could be a guy to come in late and take one of those spots. Yeah, I think that that's a good shout, Joe. My answer would just be whichever number nine catches fire. Whichever number nine is in form doing a similar enough job to what Berhalter is asking of that number nine. I think that's the player that could be in that conversation. If it's Josh Sargent, who suddenly starts rattling, like scoring goals and looking really solid again, sure. maybe he's in that conversation. Nico Giochini, maybe he gets a move and starts scoring goals. And we think, yeah, this guy could do it. I think it's really whoever finds that form. That remains the spot that to me is most wide open. I think it's number nine. Then I think it's uh, the center back conversation. And after that, it's a lot of depth pieces. But number nine and center back remain the two, I think, most open positions, even if we at the same time do have some at least fairly clear answers for who could play there. But overall, Joe, we've I've done, I think, a good enough job, I would say good, uh, of selecting our 26-player uh, roster for the Men's World Cup. Uh, one final question I wanted to note, why not take Slonina as the future star to get the experience? Uh, thank you, Borikoa, for that one. 
more Kua, excuse me. I would just say because I think a lot of that speculation was around the time that he was linked with Poland and Poland had called him in. Since he is declared for the United States, I, I think maybe some of that demand has gone down. And I think a young player, it'd be cool to give him an opportunity. But I also think you want a veteran maybe to play, but also to be the kind of balance. And just because I think he's been there throughout qualifying, that's why I lean Sean yeah. Johnson. But who knows? It could be Slonina. It could be any other player. And if it is, Joe, I'm sure we will talk about it on the Total Soccer Show. I'm sure we'll do some more live shows as well. It's always lovely to see your face on that screen, if not in person, uh, including your R Ruma Cube set. Joe, I look forward to destroying you in that someday. But for now, Joe, thank you very much for taking almost an hour to do some roster predicting with me today. You got it. Taylor, did you just say Ruma Cube? Not, I, I always thought it was Rummy Cube. Man, we'll, we'll have to talk about this later. I'll call you. We'll get this pronunciation sorted. All right. That'll be our next show, a 45-minute show about how to pronounce that that no one will listen to. Joe Lowry, thank you so much. Uh, the fine, fine folks at BR, thank you so much for making this possible. Listeners, thank you for joining us. Uh, commenters, thank you for your comments, including the ones that uh, hated on Greg Berhalter the entire time. Always to be expected. For now, thanks so much for listening. Thanks so much for watching. We'll talk to you all again soon.